Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm going to start with the first question, and if I direct it to Mufti. Uh, in the run-up to this event, lots of people were messaging me, and they said, it's amazing, we're going to come to the talk with Mufti Menk and his sons. <laughs> I was like, okay, mashallah. How are you actually related, Mufti? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our common great-grandfather is Adam alayhi salam. And that's the same with all of us. So everyone here is related through Adam and Eve. Mashallah. Nonetheless, on a more serious note, how do you think we're related? Uh, do you see similar features or? You do? Definitely. Alhamdulillah. The no. voices as well. Yeah, guys? Mashallah. Mashallah. So if they said sons, they would technically not be wrong, but they wouldn't be absolutely accurate. So we are six brothers. We are six brothers and three sisters, alhamdulillah. And these are the children of my brothers. So what that means is my eldest brother, Saeed, that's his son, Sheikh Ibrahim. My, another elder brother of mine, that's his son, Sheikh Adnan. And they're therefore my nephews, not my sons. Yeah? But uh, if they say sons, culturally, it wouldn't be wrong. Culturally, they say, you know, an uncle is as good as a father. So, mashallah, it's there. We don't look too far in age, but we are quite far in age. <laughs> if I could tell you that Sheikh Adnan is actually my son-in-law at the same time, been married to my daughter perhaps for the last six, seven years, alhamdulillah, mashallah. So that's how it works. So we do have more than one relationship, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, mashallah. The fun uncle, the fun uncle, Mufti. Eh? <laughs> I think, I think what happened is, the other brothers are a little bit older, and I've always tried to be the one who's uh, a bit more fun-loving, you know, nice, mashallah. mashallah. Funkle, funkle, the fun uncle. Alhamdulillah, Allahumma barik. Sheikh Ibrahim, a question for yourself. So what made you follow the path of studying Islam? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, just to add, Sheikh, you know, you mentioned uh, we don't look so much further, uh, far, far apart in age. And uh, someone once told me, I said, oh, he's my uncle. So they said, oh, you are his uncle. <laughs> and I, I said, come on, man, come on. You know, that's strange because I have my son as well. And uh, when, I, when, I, when I'm with him, he looks very similar. So someone said once that, uh, is that your brother? I said, no, it's not my brother. So he looked at me and he said, that's crazy. They actually think I'm your brother. But then when we went somewhere else, someone said, is that your father? And I'm like, what my father, my son, man? You know? <laughs> so the people sometimes don't really understand. You're right, mashallah, barakallah feek, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, with regards to the question, I've been studying Islam with my granddad from a very young age. In fact, my alif and ba was taught by him. And I attribute my beginnings to him. Uh, so essentially, we were born into a family that studied Islam. Alhamdulillah, and that's I attribute after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to my grandfather. So that, alhamdulillah, was a huge driver for me to study Islam. It was what I knew. It was what I was familiar with because he taught us the Qur'an. He taught us the tafsir of the Qur'an. He taught us, I remember him sitting, studying words for the next day's lesson and writing them down. And then the next day we would hear those words in the lesson. So subhanAllah, it's something that we studied from a very young age. Myself and Sheikh Adnan were together in some of these classes as well. So it's something that just comes naturally. So when the opportunity to go to Medina came, it, Alhamdulillah, it was one of those things I knew. We always looked up to our uncle, uh, Sheikh Ismail, uh, Mufti Ismail. We looked up to him. And we looked up to him as not only a scholar of deen, but like, they said, like he said, a fun scholar of deen. It was different to the norm. You know, usually you have a sheikh, a maulana, you sit quietly in front of him, put your head down and listen. And here we could interact, we could speak, we could laugh, we could joke, we enjoyed his lectures, alhamdulillah. So it's something that really inspired me to, you know, further my studies in Medina. That's definitely... Can I, can I add something quick? Of course you can. He's speaking about my father. My father, mashallah, he has taught all of us, all his children and his grandchildren. And with that, he has established massive institutions 
thousands of people have turned to Islam. Thousands of people have benefited, learned the deen. They've been empowered in terms of dunya as well. So he is a hero to all of us. My father, their grandfather. And to this day, he still sits as old as he is. He's about 88. May Allah grant him goodness. He still sits and teaches. He cannot... Uh, you know, not do something. He has to be doing something. So anyone who's really interested, he'll sit and teach them Quran and Arabic. Another thing, anyone whom he's taught the Quran to, they are professional Quranic reciters. And really, he's amazing in his teaching. Allah's blessed him, mashallah. Amazing, alhamdulillah. They say, you know, a tree by its fruits, alhamdulillah. And we've been able to witness and benefit from his fruits. So we pray for the long life and goodness of the tree. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and it's also actually a lesson for all of us. Sometimes we think about building legacies and what legacy means, different things to different people. But creating and starting a legacy, and alhamdulillah, the likes that we see now, that you can go forward, that's a witness of good work for you. That's something that we all want, inshallah. Sheikh Adnan. What do you say is the right age to be married? You'll be careful because your father-in-law's here. <laughs> what do you say is the right age to be married? Bismillah rahman rahim Obviously, it's uh, different from uh, person to person, place to place, the maturity and the development of people as they grow up. So you can't really put an, a, a number to it. People are different. Their circumstances are different. Their financial levels are different. The way they've matured, the way they've grown up, etc. So there's no real right or wrong age. Obviously, if somebody's reached uh, the age of majority in Islam, uh, we are encouraged to get married and not delay. As long as there's no reason to delay, person has uh, you know, sound intellect and they're able to then, uh, inshallah, they go forth and Allah will bless them. Obviously, you're sitting with, uh, mashallah, Sheikh, who's a counselor for more than 30 years, so he, he can add to that. Mufti, I would definitely need you to add to that. And also, I, don't, I don't like the way it's going because everything is coming back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. I think it's right. I, I agree with what he said. You know, perhaps when a person... All I need to say to this is don't unnecessarily delay. That's what I want to say. Because look, when you're young, it's easy, it's easier. You're, you're a little bit more broader in your selection. So you marry someone and you grow with them for as long as you're two very good people who are compatible. But as you grow older, you started your journey already. The other person started their journey without you. You're going to meet up at 30, 35. It's not going to be so easy to come together at that age. You become more and more fussy as you grow older. This is my experience from the last so many years. So if you're 20 and you're married, it's much more likely that you're going to have... Uh, you know, uh, much more goodness by the will of Allah. Not to say that it wouldn't bring about goodness if you had to delay, but this the hadith encourages us, oh youth, if you're able and capable, don't delay, get married. So following that, we stick by that advice and believe that it is true and it is the way it should be. So if there is a reason why you're delaying, then perhaps, you know, let's hear it and let's, let's see what it is. Otherwise, without a proper reason, Go for it. I know a lot of young people, especially the girls, they say, no, I don't want to get married, you know, because they witness divorces. They witness so many negatives. But, you know, we have to go. It's one of the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to try. Many people have been through divorce sometimes. And after that, they are so happy. They are so happy they marry someone else later on. It's not the end of the world. May Allah make it easy for us. Ameen, ameen. Connected to that, Mufti, at what age did you get married? 19. 19, mashallah. So I have grandchildren. I have 10 children and three grandchildren, direct grandchildren, and perhaps another one very soon. And like I say, four of my children are married and the others are still to get married. I even, one day, in one of my lectures, I said, guys, I have eight daughters and two sons. So all the boys better be in good behavior because we're watching you. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. Can Incentive, I? if ever there was one. Can I say something? Of course, of course, Sheikh. Yeah. Uh, spoken like a true man practices what he preaches, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, alhamdulillah. Old, alhamdulillah. Mashallah. 19, you know, I, I think today, 19, we, we consider it people are still children. So, so, so what happens is 
a lot of the times people say, well, you know what, I'm looking for someone who's, who's, who's got a good salary, a lovely house, a beautiful car. When I married, I had nothing. I relied fully and totally on my father. And there was nothing wrong, and it was amazing. I want to encourage the parents who are here. You know what? It's not bad to rely on someone's father. For as long as that father's not going to be interfering in your life, you will have a decent marriage. It's okay. The same parents who are now saying we need a wealthy son-in-law have had uh, issues in their own lives when they started up and they didn't really have much. So we need to go easy on that. It's not wrong to rely on folks. I know people who've relied on their in-laws, like Musa alayhi salam. He relied on his in-laws. He was marrying a man who employed him and said, you're going to work for me for so many years. You can take my daughter. He says, well, there goes. I'll do it. So it's not wrong. Today, because we're living on you know, social media, we're comparing our lives to the lives of people we think exist, but they're just showing you a life that they're not actually living. So it becomes very toxic. And because of that, people are looking for someone who's so wealthy that anything I want, I can have anywhere I want to go and eat out. I never, ever ate out throughout my childhood. And even when I got married initially, for years on end, we didn't ever visit a restaurant. We couldn't afford it. So Alhamdulillah, it happened a bit later and Allah opened the doors. We thank Allah. The reason I'm saying this is just to let people think, you know, food for thought, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Um, Sheikh Ibrahim, maybe we can get some advice from you. You can take this question how you want. How does one approach the opposite gender for marriage? This isn't chat up lines, please, Sheikh. <laughs> <laughs> MashaAllah. Uh, this is actually a very important question because today people complain, and especially the youth, they complain about the fact that how do I get married when I can't speak or I'm not supposed to speak to the op opposite gender? And Oftentimes, there are cultural barriers more than there are Islamic barriers. In this country, you know, one of the places where we find the youth see each other or get to know each other are at universities. We're not talking about whether it's ideal to go to university or not. But they are there. You see someone you like. You see someone you are interested in. I think there is nothing wrong with you approaching that person, striking up a conversation in a good manner. Don't use the chat-up lines. Uh, strike up a conversation in a good manner with regards to per perhaps course material or anything, use your imagination, and then when you find the appropriate time, express your intention. Say, I've come because, you know, X, Y, and Z, I have some interest in you. Are you interested? My interest is based on Islam. You know, I want to, I'm looking for nikah, etc., so I don't think there would be anything wrong with you doing that, number one. And I say this because many of us feel that I can't approach a sister or I can't approach a brother. But in reality, the other gender is thinking the same. And they also think, hey, we can't. And there's these cultural taboos, etc. Hold on. If you are doing it in a respectful manner, look at Musa alayhi salatu was salam with which... Mufti mentioned the story of Musa alayhi salatu was salam when he sees the two women. He approaches. He says, Qala ma khatbukuma. What is your issue? How can I help you? And the end of that is that they get married. So you have to take these steps. That's not the only way. You can approach the uncles and aunties. You know, there are those uncles and aunties in society that are well known to match people together. Approach them. Tell them, I'm looking for marriage. And another barrier is that we think that people know what we are thinking. So we tell two people and we say, I've told people I want to get married. No, go to a hundred people. Go to as many people as possible. Trustworthy people, people that, you, uh, that are in your circles. Tell them, look, I'm looking to get married. If you know anyone suitable, then suggest. So do your best. And... Allah grant him goodness, my father always says, do your best and to Allah leave the rest. Do your best and to Allah leave the rest. As for social media and getting on to DMs, etc., I encourage you not to do this. I discourage you from doing this because you shouldn't slide, you know, they call it sliding into the DMs. Why are you sliding in the first place? 
You know, there's a negative connotation to that. Why are you sliding? Go, knock on the door, say, this is what I want, you know? So, <laughs> there are apps today out there, I'm not promoting one, but I'm saying there are apps that are monitored by those who are above, those who are higher in authority, etc., on the, uh, like the, from the management of the app, they are monitored. Those are safer options than going on to Instagram and sliding into someone's DM. So if you really must, then Bismillah, use these apps and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you. Uh, this is a question that I've received many times and I keep receiving. So it's a very important question. Barakallah fi. Jazakumullah. Can, can I add one quick thing? Sorry. I just want to say that perhaps we should involve our parents early on, very early. Because when you don't, you're bitten mm. a lot of the times. So even, and, and what Sheikh Ibrahim is saying is right, that you are at a university, you are working, you have colleagues, you see someone, you watch them with their deen, you see prayer time, they're taking it seriously, such a lovely brother or sister, you need to open your mouth. And I would prefer that you actually spoke to, if it's a girl, you can speak to your folks to say, you know what, there's a brother at work, I, don't, I haven't even spoken to him, but... He's really a suitable candidate. Wallahi, if my child came to me with that, I would go and meet the guy. I would take him out for a coffee. I, as a father, would go and take him out for a coffee and tell him, you know what, I believe you're working with my daughter. Well, mashallah, you know, etc. Take him a bottle of perfume and so on and suss him out. And then you can pick up if he's really not what he is, you're going to do your research. The problem is when she's already developed a relationship with her, she wants me as a parent to come in and rubber stamp a guy who's on weed. Come on, no ways. Yeah, I'd send him to my grandfather to polish his tajweed first. <laughs> <laughs> MashaAllah. I think if I can respectfully add also, you see any sisters, if there's guys who are interested in you, if they're serious and sincere, they will have no, no qualms in meeting your wali, in the parents. No, they won't for a moment hesitate. 100%. Because one of the things, look, a, a guy is wired differently from a girl. And the thinking is different. Everything, you know, is, is I was going to say weird, but I'm a guy. So, so <laughs> I'll tell you what, if, if you're going to allow them to play with you, wallahi, they will play with you. But if you're going to put your line and your barrier, they're going to respect you. If they're really serious, out of 100, one or two might be serious. Trust me, the other 99 are players. Sorry. Allah make it easy. Alhamdulillah. Guys were not impressed with what I said, right? <laughs> you never thought they were players before. <laughs> no, the only playing they do is football. Right? Mashallah, <laughs> mashallah. Sheikh Adnan, a question for yourself. Does a parent have a right to disagree with the choice of spouse of their son or daughter? Well, I think Mufti just put it perfectly where he said it's obviously the best to get the blessings of your parents. And obviously anybody who's been married... Even if you've run off with somebody, the love of your life or whatever it may be, there comes a time where two human beings living together, they grew up differently, they think differently. You're going to clash on a few different things. And what tends to happen is that people who haven't taken the blessings of their parents, then they start to regret, should I or shouldn't uh, have I, or should, should I have done this? Or should I have actually waited and gotten the blessings of my Parents. So I think it's uh, important, he put it well, to say that try your best to involve the parents and get their blessings. You save a lot of headache later on. <laughs> Absolutely. Mufti, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with him. And if you're saying that, you know, do, do they have a right? In the case of a guy, he might uh, be able to technically have a nikah officiated without his parents. And we would say it's valid. In the case of a girl... According to the majority of the scholars, she needs her father. She needs someone. And I tell you, that's a mercy of Allah because when, when a girl is all on her own going in, the people that she's married into know that she's got no one. The chances of her being abused are more than if they know she's got guys around her, brothers, parents, her father, uncles, and especially if the guys have met these people and they're big patans, you know, meaning they, they, they're big guys, you know, and, and, and you see and you look at them, the minute you want to talk to his daughter, you remember the face of the father, you say, Salaam Alaikum, 
you know, you look at like, you know, you, you chilled because you know that, whoa, this person's got everyone behind them who's probably not going to tolerate my nonsense. That's the whole idea of having a protection, you know, to say, listen, I give you my daughter. Remember, when I've given my daughters away, I've always said, look, all I need you to do is please respect her and honor her. That's it. Respect, offer her respect and honor. The rest of it, inshallah, slowly but surely, you guys can navigate through it. I've never interfered in the lives of my, uh, you know, sons-in-law or my daughter-in-law in the case of my son. Never interfered. I've let them do whatever. But all I always tell them is just learn to respect each other and honor each other. That's it. I wouldn't like to see someone coming, screaming and abusing, swearing my own daughter. It would hurt me. I gave you this child. You know, it's not for me. Uh, it's something that you've that would actually be a red line. May Allah Almighty make it easy for all of us. Amen. Amen. I mean, this is a huge topic by itself, and we've got some questions on it. Um, I can say, look, one of the issues I was dealing with locally, Mufti, was a girl who wanted to get married to someone. The parents were thinking about it, and they said, give us some time. The, the girl's in-laws put pressure on her to the point she'd say something, and then in the evening she's like, no, 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 goes against it. And I remember speaking to her. This almost broke my heart, to be honest, if I can say this. I asked her the question. I said, do you have any complaints about your parents? And the parents were asking, just wait one week, Mufti, one week. And they'll do the nikah so they can announce it to their, their, their relatives. I said to the girl, I said, do you have any complaints about your parents? She said, no. And I asked her, I said, for 23 years of your life, they brought you up with love and kindness? And she said, yes. I said, they gave you 23 years? and you can't give them one week. And the boy side pushed ahead and did the nikah without the father. And they got a random uncle who the girl had never met to stand in the place of the wali. You see the parents, they were heartbroken. You know, Mufti, like what would you say in this? And all it takes is a little bit of patience. I agree with you completely. I've been involved in similar matters for many, many years. And a lot of the times, a few years into that marriage, there's a lot of regret, which they don't realize. You need your families. However, there are some families where the folks are totally unreasonable. Totally unreasonable. You know, they're tribalistic, racist sometimes. In those cases, I would, you know, relate to the, the people trying to get married. And we may have to involve in... You know, like they say, transfer the guardianship to a third party only where there is legitimate reason to do so after all avenues of trying to get the folks in are exhausted. But otherwise, don't, don't tread that territory. It's not worth it. I mean, imagine you get married, you have a child. How excited are you? You don't know 20 years down the line this child's going to make you cry tears of blood. So it's really sad. May Allah make it easy. Ameen. Ameen. Amazing. So, Mufti, the next question. This gets really technical at times of marriage. Alhamdulillah, the good news is there. Everything's been decided. Parents are happy on both sides. Then comes the question, what is the mahar? And how do you determine what it will be? 50K. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I mean, that's, for some of you might have seen someone ask me a question to say, if, if, if the demand of mahar is 50K, is it a red, la a red flag or a green flag? What did I say? red flag. And people in the comments were like, why, why? Look, I tell you, mahar is a gift. It's a gift determined by the bride and should be communicated to the groom. They should give it or he should give it to her as a gift. He doesn't have to give it immediately. He can give it later and sometimes she can even waive it later on. It's not a selling price. It's not a buying price. It does not say much about who you are. So in wealthy communities, it would naturally be a little bit more, depending on the orf or the norm. So if the norm of a community is 50K, by all means 50K. If the norm of the community is something, then less, because make it easy for people to marry. But generally, 95% of the public, a youngster in his 20s getting married does not have 50K. Imagine he's gonna enter into marriage with a mentality that I'm in debt. What success do you want him to achieve in life? It's not something, it's not a bride price, as they say. So, usually you look at what is known as mahrul mithil. That's a sunnah. Look at the girls of the same family, and what did they get? So, when I got married, I paid 100 pounds. 100 pounds mahar. 
And I wouldn't trade my wife for the world. I promise you. 100 pounds. And what have I given her from that time to now? I don't even know the figure she doesn't. I don't think there is anything she's ever asked me for that I haven't done. I, I'm just letting you know. And what did I pay? 100 pounds. And I promise you, it's not because people say, oh, this guy's a simp. Come, come, bro, let's show you. That's, I, I didn't even know the meaning of simp until they used it on me. And I felt that the guy talking is less... Uh, let me not get into that debate. But anyway, but to be honest with you, to be good and kind and to be kind to those who've served you, they've been there for you through thick and thin. When I started my life, I guarantee you, if I wanted to marry people, they probably would have said no, not at all. So all those who might be interested later on when you're a successful man, please understand they don't belong in your life. That's all. Do you know why? They would never have sacrificed if they were put into your life 20 years earlier. The way the one who's there has sacrificed. You just need to understand this. And so therefore, the, the, the amount given doesn't confirm whether you're going to be happier or not. So what do you want? If you're in there for money, you're going to say 50K, get a divorce. Another 50K, get another divorce. Before you know it, I've got 500K. Now I can go and marry properly whoever I want. It's not a business. It's not that. The idea is I'm going to marry someone, token amount. What is it? It is like a down payment, in my explanation, to say from today onwards, I'm responsible for all your expenses. It's on me. So from today onwards, this is the first amount. If you ever need any money, come to me and inshallah, I'll try and you know, help you for as long as it's reasonable. That's what it is, if you look at it from that angle. So there's nothing fixed. And I would say that the, e, the, the more understanding you are of the situation of the guy getting married and also the guy should be understanding of the family he's getting married into and then you determine some a figure that's you know easy inshallah bi'ibnillah some people say uh, a million riyal i seen this in writing which is payable if you divorce me that also is against the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu I understand what they're trying to achieve, but then it's toxic. I'm entering into a slavery agreement. I mean, I can't get out of it because if I want to get out of it, I've got to pay a million bucks. And what they do, they, they run you into a khula and they run you into something disastrous where if anything goes bad, they never ever give you the talaq until you squeeze it out of them because they don't want to issue it. They're going to have to pay you a million bucks. So there's a lot of uh, negativity in that. Let's go easy, simple ways, and Allah make us, inshallah, successful in our marriages. Ameen. Ameen, Ya Rab. So final question for yourself, Sheikh Ibrahim, as we close this session shortly. Any advice for anyone finding it difficult to get married? Look for chastity. Uh, well, try, try to be chaste. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْنِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ That they should be chaste. Who? Those who are not finding nikah until Allah gives them of his bounty. Until Allah gives them of his ghina. So oftentimes we say that, you know what, marriage is a money hole that you're just going to drop money into. But in reality... Allah will give you financial independence through that nikah. And this is just a side point. But for those who cannot find nikah, just be chaste and be patient. And that which will come afterwards will be amazing. Because you've reached nikah and you have never done this in your life. So imagine the joy, the pleasure, the amazement that you receive from that as opposed to a person who has done it in a haram manner and they get to nikah they already know it doesn't mean much to them what value would you have for that nikah going into it knowing that this is what i have i've already experienced it i already know what it is and for those who are not chaste as well you've trained yourself to get tired of the person in a short space of time. You're done with what you want from them. Well, now it's over. That's all I needed. I've got it. And move on to the next. So, try to be chaste. Try to look after, you know, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that one who guarantees that which is between his jaws and that which is, which is between his legs, I guarantee him Jannah. And think about that. It's not easy. It's not easy to guarantee that you will not say that which is wrong, utter that which is evil, immoral, curse and abuse. And it is not easy to also guarantee that which is between your legs, the private parts. And this is an avenue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, nikah. So wait until that moment and inshallah your marriage will not only be successful, but you will value it much more as opposed to those who don't actually uh, abide by this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get those who are single married. Ameen. Ameen. And may Allah rabbul izzati wa jalal make it easy for us to make it easy for them as well. Ameen. 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 Ameen ya Rabb. Sheikh Adnan. What are some red flags when it comes to a proposal and not just 50k mahar? <laughs> the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُهُ The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling you that if somebody comes with his deen is intact and good character and conduct, then get him married. So the red flags would be the opposite of that. So somebody's deen is not in order. Uh, somebody doesn't have good character and good conduct. Obviously, it's a red flag. Now, we've also got to differentiate between people who are practicing. Let's say that your compulsory acts of worship are in order. After that, people differ. So you find those who are knowledgeable, those who are learned, it may not be the most appropriate for you in your situation to get married to somebody who may not be as knowledgeable. And at the same time, we've got to realize and understand that people grow with time. So sometimes you find somebody has a bad habit, but it's something they want to work on, something they, uh, you know, making improvements on. So we've also got to differentiate between that. And one more thing I'd like to mention is uh, with social media and with people online, people tell you that, you know what, if you see this in your husband or your wife or your potential, it's a red flag. Not realizing that the person who's speaking at times, they're not married. Uh, they have marriage courses, they've never been married. 18-year-olds giving advice on how you should be married. So you've got to understand, you know, the whole thing of red flags, red flags. What is a red flag and what isn't a red flag? Of course, Jazakumullah. They end up being false flags. <laughs> we'll have a false flag operation when you don't choose it correctly. Uh, Mufti, just as some final closing advice on this topic, what would you say to all of us, actually, those married and those not married? MashaAllah. Firstly, try to be the person whom you want to marry. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Try to be the person in character and conduct whom you would like to see or the characteristics you have that you would like to see in a person you want to marry. So if you're just going to be... I'll give you an example. Yesterday someone sent me an email to say they were so interested in a guy and he just cut them off and they, please make dua, I really want to marry this guy and so, so. And I sent a, a reply saying that you want a guy like him but he doesn't want a person like you. It's clear. So all you have to do is develop yourself to a point where a person like that would actually want a person like you. You know, it's, it's one of those, uh, those things. One of the brothers told me that I went to propose to someone religious person, really amazing, and, and so much more, and I met them. I was quite interested, and I called for a second meeting after the first one went very well, and I had one request to say, please, can I see you without makeup? You won't believe it ended there. <laughs> and, and, and that's why I say it cut there. The microphone cut even before I got to that. Can you imagine? Anyway. So when it came to me, I was very saddened because imagine the brothers had to put makeup and a sister, imagine it was the other way around and men wore makeup. And a sister came up and said, brother, I'd like to see you without your makeup. And the guy says, but why? Why are you judging me? I'm going to marry you. I'm going to get up right next to you. I don't mind. I've got flaws. I'm sure you may. Don't be enslaved by something that's not you love yourself the way you are and if someone loves you with your eye bags and your fly bags 
then alhamdulillah, all of that, mashallah, is the package they're going to get. It is definitely within a guy's rights to say, I'd like to meet you without makeup. If anything, without them saying it, when you go for a marriage meeting, it should be without makeup. I mean, and why I say this is, imagine if it's the other way around. Many sisters don't agree, but that's not fair. I mean, it's, it's, it's like buying a product where they're telling you, you're not allowed to look at the engine, just look at the car from outside and that's it. I mean, come on. Okay, maybe not as bad as an engine. We just want to make sure. <laughs> but we just want to make sure that, you know, it's the right person. So sometimes this is very, uh, it's a very serious matter. So learn to be yourself and do not give up. That's something very important. Don't give up if one thing went wrong, two things. People say, I'll never trust a, a guy again. Well, you went into the wrong boat as well, you know. So don't say never trust a guy. Heal and go for it again. Check again. Do, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Keep trying. One day, inshallah, you marry your king or your queen. May Allah Almighty make it easy. And like I said, and I stand by my words, Try to have the qualities within you that you would like to see in the one whom you're trying to get married to or the type of person you would like. May Allah bless you all. Amen. Yes. Uh, men, men do actually wear makeup today. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know people say I wear makeup, right? Actually, I don't. Stop. As you can see, they say, so what makes you look so, so younger? I know. I finally discovered the phones are being more and more advanced. MashaAllah. And the cameras are becoming more and more advanced. That's what's making us look much younger. I can think I, that's what it is, yeah? Can I say that, uh, you, you can't say this pro probably, but I can say it. It's the noor, inshallah. Uh, may Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Uh, you know, we, we will only know on the day of Qiyamah who, who has better deeds. That's why I say don't judge people because you don't know where they are in, in, in the race on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah make it easy. Uh, nonetheless, may Allah Almighty bless every one of us and grant us goodness. Jazakumullah khair. I think this uh, talk was absolutely amazing. The questions were on point. I'm sure by the time we leave here, everyone will be married, inshallah. <laughs> there was a brother, there was a brother who said, Sheikh, I'm looking for a wife. This was in Nigeria. And we agreed with the organizers that we'll tell the, the, the we'll, we'll call the brother up on the stage and say, look, this brother, you know who he is, is looking for a wife. And you won't believe the number of hands that would have gone up to say, okay, you know, meaning we're interested, you know. In some communities, it's quite open. But nonetheless, he shied out of it. He didn't come up on the stage. So we said, there's a brother who's not married. And he just said, nah, you know, not me, and so on. And he shied out. So if anyone was bold enough to say, I want to get married, we could do it here and now. <laughs> but then again, we need your father's permission, don't we? <laughs> That's just banter. Barakallah feekum. Jazakumullah khair.